Hi, and welcome to On the Couch, Conversations with Brenda Porter. I sit down with various artists uh, or those people who work with artists, and we have a conversation about what they do and how they do it. Today's guest is Margot Moore. Margot is a, an actor of screen and stage. She has been acting since age three, she, where she sang and performed in her church and in theater productions in her hometown of Brooklyn, New York. Since that time, she has been working nonstop. You may have seen her in Queen Sugar, Shock and Awe, uh, The Outsiders, The Gifted, Let's Stay Together, Drop Dead Diva, Sheena, ATL, Odd Girl Out, Kenan and Kale, Forrest Gump, Runaway Jewelry, The Wedding. She is truly a gifted actress. Welcome, Marta. Hello. I did not realize until I read your bio that you were actually from New York. I didn't yes, know that. Uh, I'm a Brooklyn baby. Let's die, do or die. I think I met you back in the 80s. We, we did a show together. We did a show at Seven Stages. But you and I were on Whoa. stage together, and I got photos somewhere in this house to prove it. Connor, he is coming home. I know we had a shopping cart, and we had on some colorful outfits. Trim check for somebody did the music for it. Um, you and I have been on stage and on screen. Not many people can say that. You know, and I feel very honored. I feel very indebted to you because I feel like my work on film is due to your encouragement. And you guided me through. And I really, really appreciate that. Much more than you'll ever know. I'm still trying to figure out the difference between theater and film. But, um, well, we just, you know, theater's bigger and you get a lot more time to process it. And film, you don't. You have to jump in and sink or swim and pray that it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did a, a series and I had 17 different directors all for one show and they come in and you just have to go with it you have to you know the show well enough after the first few episodes to know what is expected and you know after the pilot and but it grows it changes evolves and then you get directors who are clueless as to what it is that you really do and you have to kind of help them out and be gracious in it i don't know film makes to me makes theater easier hmm. because of you have to learn lines we audition a lot you have days where you have two or three auditions in one day and you're memorizing all this dialogue and you just have to go for it you don't have time to think about well what i think <laughs> but no, you got time for all of that. Especially if you're in a show or uh, you're doing a series and it's a million dollars an episode. They don't really have time for what you think unless you're the principal lead. And um, you just have to go, you have to wing it. A lot of times we don't even know what, we don't get the scripts in Atlanta a lot. Of, we don't know what, what we're even in it for. We just come in and take that piece of the slice of life that you brought with it and go go for it. So I, I think I think film makes us better actors. That's really interesting. I've never heard anybody say that. But I because I know I that theater makes you a better film actor. Right, it does. And then uh, film allows us, affords us the opportunity to do theater. But once you, and you have to be able to go in between the two because it, it takes years for you to come from the theater. Because the theater is big and expressive and you're creating, you're already there. So you don't have to create it. And then the, the lens is so small and you have to decide who you're talking to and what story you're telling. And, 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 and it's just a lot more intimate. So once you come to understand the intimacy of film and uh, the lens and you do stuff out of sequence, but it's, I call it on the job training. That's what I call it. It is on the job training. You arrive on the set prepared. You stay in your trailer. You're running your lines. You're doing hair and makeup. When they call you, you're ready because time is money. And I tell young actors from the moment you arrive on the set, you put your foot on the ground, they're talking about you. 
Ms. Moore is here. And everything that Ms. Mora says or does from the moment that she hits that set until they wrap her for the evening or they wrap her for a month or whatever, it's all recorded. We have a production unit manager. His or her job is to bring the piece in on time, in or under budget. And even in the makeup trailer, they know you're there. They know if you're having a problem. They know if you're causing a problem. And then you don't know who you're talking to. Keep trying to, in, in the makeup trailer, you don't know whose daughter is in there, you know, mm. whose wife is working and you just don't know. You do not know, but they are always ears and they're always listening. And you're there to make the project work. And that is really your job because we like to think that the talent is, the talent is last on the list. Mm. They have to have you, but they've spent an awesome amount of money preparing for you to be there, to be comfortable and to do the job. And if you have the reputation of coming in and doing your job, then you'll work a lot and you get called to work. You'll get called to work. You don't even have to audition. Oh yeah, just send her on in. Oh yeah, we've worked with her before because of your work ethic. And so that's, that's the thing. You're there to serve, not to be served. They're going <laughs> to pay you, your check, your money. I mean, we, we've been hearing horror stories lately. You know, people coming late, people not showing up. You're costing people money <laughs> if you're late. If you decide not to come and then you come late, then you decide you want to eat. And then you want to take pictures with the stars. No, <laughs> baby, you're right. You're trying to be invisible, okay? So <laughs> you, you want to be an ultimate professional. And again, it's on the job training. I mean, things happen, but then that's why you have an agent manager to be able to call ahead and say well we had a you know there's traffic or something like that but from the moment you you say yes and you and you don't sign the contract until you're on the set as you know uh and from then on you're there to serve the piece i did a um a piece with green the green leaf right so okay i i went and i left my wig and okay. we were shooting way up in like uh, almost Alfred. Oh. And I left my wig down in East Point. I got, I was on time. I got all dressed. I got everything and went, where's my wig? They sent someone to my house, get my wig. I know they did. But they got there and I forgot to give them my keys. They had to come back up to get my keys and go back. Well, see, gone are the days where we didn't provide anything. Or now I did do, uh, I played, was it The Outsider? I did that here. And the wig that I had, they just, I give it to them. You keep it because I don't want to do anything to it. I want, because of continuity, the wig has to look the same. <laughs> and so you can't like take it home and decide you're going to wash it or recurl it or do something crazy. You, it has to match. So that helps make their life easier. And so the next time, just leave your wig with them. I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> because they yeah, had some they other wigs, you know, that they tried on, but they liked the wig that I had auditioned with. So you have to match it. I had a wig that I took some headshots back in 2006 or something. And I did uh, something with Rob Reiner down in New Orleans. And he liked the wig that was on the headshot. Child, I couldn't tell you what it was. I don't know. Do you know I had to find, I had to, I went down to Morrow, Georgia to this week's shop on Mount Zion Road and we had to find a very close wig. Then I had to send it to the hair and makeup so that they could look at it. I had to put the wig on and do a, I don't know if I did, I FaceTimed them or I might have face whatever I did because we tried to sell him on the wig that I had. And he was like, I like that wig. <laughs> now, you don't need to be told that but one time by a producer. <laughs> that means there's no other wig, okay? Because first of all, we fooled half of them because they think it's our hair. So it's like, oh no, don't you come down here. Don't you send us a headshot with a full head of hair and then you come down here looking like Brenda without her wig on. <laughs> don't do it. Because now you've upset the whole kitten caboodle. You've upset all the hair and makeup. So the thing that I want to say about this is that in the theater, it's a team. And in film, it's just a bigger team being paid a lot more money. 
mm. and the idea of the look. So if, if they are okaying these looks because they see you and your look prior to your arrival, then you must come with that look. And I always think it's so crazy that we work in uh, industry of imagination, but the production people have none. They're not getting paid to have imagination. They're getting paid to keep their jobs. They're getting paid to, you go in, you try on the wardrobe. And I was telling another fellow actress, um, the, the wardrobe, you know, I tell them, you know, I might, I need things that breathe like cotton or silk. I don't need Polly and any of her sisters because y'all don't want me upsetting the, you don't want me perspiring a lot or anything. You want me to be cool and comfortable. They have the right to change what you're wearing and what your hair look like and what kind of shoes you're wearing. And I would say, Margot is not the character unless they're doing the Margot Mora show. I have to be the character. And this is what the designer has decided that the character must wear. And so there, the, you have designers who want to please you. Do oh, you like this? And I want to say, no, I don't like that. But I'm like, oh no, we, we can make this work. <laughs> My job <laughs> is to make it work. I've, I've had scenes that I've had to save. When we did Forrest Gump, <laughs> The, the minister who's performing the wedding is like 90 something years old. And he can't remember none of the lines. So there are times when you have to step up and step in and make things work, okay? Mm -hmm. we, I was doing a piece called Tad up in Virginia many years ago. I was playing Elizabeth Keckley and um, they were getting ready to do a scene. And you know, we have all these period costumes with the corsets on, the modest to Mary Todd Lincoln. And you, you gotta have your, you know. And when we hit the location site, coming out of wardrobe, coming out of my trailer, they weren't doing that scene. Now, I don't know how it there became a mix up, but I looked at that director and I said, no problem heist up those hoops and the corset and me and the wardrobe and we ran and we changed clothes. And I, it had to be 10 minutes or less and we were back. And it, it couldn't be anything about, you couldn't even go through all of what some people would have gone through because we're allowed as union actors at least 30 minutes to put on something. But we had to change and be back and he thanked me. And of course I worked with him many times after that. You mentioned you worked on series where you've had more than one director and yet you have played the same character. How do you make yeah. that consistent? Because you've got different directors with different ideas and different ways they want to take the character. So how do you work with that? Well, they, I'm, I'm assuming if we're like into episode 13, they've looked or had a chance to look at the footage. They have an idea of where the writers are going and in, and in, in the, the show I was talking about was Sheena. And I did have a gentleman who shall remain nameless and I was a shaman and first it started with me saying, they said, well, they're doing Sheena, the jungle princess. I said, okay, if she the princess, I must be the queen. <laughs> and they were like, okay. Cause at first they were like, I thought in my ignorance that Sheena was not Caucasian. And it was like, so my agent said, okay, 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 she's African-American. So then I decided I would do it. And then when I went and I met with the producers, I said, what do I think about this white girl running around in the jungle? And they said, well, then they gave me the backstory. Well, you know, her parents died and you took her in and yada, yada, yada. And I was like, okay, I can roll with that. <laughs> I can roll with that. So then we had, so being Kali, as I was, because they were calling me Kali, and I told them, Kali was in California in their kitchen. Kali was in Africa, okay? So there's some things, if you, 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 you have to know how to, to get the word across, the message across, because there are a lot of things that, uh, different cultures, they don't understand the culture. So you have to let them know what it is. So we're at a restaurant scene and I'm being Queen Kali sitting up waiting on Sheena to do something. And this director wanted to know, what would I be doing? And I was like, I would be sitting at the table. <laughs> he thought maybe I would be up bringing drinks or something. I'm not a maid, I'm Kali. I'm the shaman of the village. So therefore, sometimes you have to give them enlightenment. And in his case, he got enlightened. 
because he also thought back to the old days of the witch doctors and you circling people with that fan and you're, oh, you know, he thought that was happening too. I'm like, no, Kali has been to, to the university. <laughs> 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 she does not do any of that witch doctory thing. She doesn't do that. And she does not wait tables. So that's how you get everybody on the same page. Because if they but, ask a question, they're not going to answer it. But if they don't ask the question and they just tell you this is what they want. Then you make it work within what you all have been doing. And I was number three principal on that. And then if the, the producer or, or number one or two thinks we wouldn't do that, we wouldn't do that. But that's when it's family. When you can do a series and I think I did 35 episodes, you, that's family, that's different. Then you coming in for uh, a day player or something like that, and you're there to make it happen. This last year, you just completed a film where you were playing Barbara Jordan. Yes, and that's a, a show that I auditioned for three different roles. And even my daughter auditioned, but one of the stars decided they wanted Amber for it. And uh, one of the stars decided she wasn't going, in her conflict, she was not going to give it up. She was going to do the role. But Amber would have been, she and I would have been in that one together. And the directors did not know, or producers did not know that we knew each other until after I wrapped. And then I told the producer who I was. I'm Amber's mom, because that's who I am. So uh, this this um, film, is, it's called The Gloria. The Gloria. The Glorious, Gloria Steinem. And they look at her at different times in her lifetime. Young Gloria, be, and then uh, middle Gloria, and then Gloria Steinem as we do her. And they travel with her around the country. And so it was about the time for the ERA and the different um, conferences and conventions. And of course, we know that Barbara Jordan spoke. And uh, we spent 17 hours at a auditorium, uh, like a civic center in Savannah and um, doing the work. And I mean, the, the homework of course is done at home as it should be. You, you know, you, you, you research the character, you understand how she speaks. And it, for a while I was like, why does she talk like that? Well, she's a PK. Her father was a minister. I said, okay, okay. So I understand the statue and I understand the delivery and I understand that she was the first of many. And so she brought all of that to the table. And so when she does this particular piece that I happen to be able to pull up, and that's why actors research is so important. You have to find out everything that you can find out about the character, about the person you're portraying us. And especially if it's a real person, you find out, you know, we're in Texas and everything about Texas to me is big. And um, they do things in a big way. And uh, she, she was just somebody you could listen to her talk and speak for hours, what, what she believed and what she wanted to have done. And as an activist, and, and, to, and to hold the position that she had and to be the only woman there a lot of times and they haven't to get information from her and she's setting the record straight. They were quite pleased because I guess I could, from my mother, anybody my mother met, she could talk like them, you know, within minutes or moments of meeting them. Now she was shy. She would not ever get up on a stage or speak in a crowd, but I think I kind of inherited that from her so that, so accents and things come really easy to me. And so that I always think that helps that we can take on the persona of the, 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 the person that we're portraying. Now you mentioned your daughter, Amber. She started acting at a very young age, as you did. Amber uh, was an interesting person to me because what I tell people, children will tell you what they're going to do and who they're going to be. We were doing Shaking the Mess Out of Misery. Amber was 18 months old. I used to take Amber to rehearsals. We did something called the Gospel Show, the Atlanta Gospel Show. Amber would have a blanket and her toys and her stuff, and she would sit there and play. And even when I went to choir rehearsal at church, they say I was the only person, and now I think about it, I was the only person that ever brought their child into the big chancel choir rehearsal. And she would sit, and people couldn't understand why she could sit and just be, I guess, because she and I had a rapport, and she understood that 
mommy's doing what she's doing and I'm just along for the ride. So my mother had come in from South Carolina, my brother had flown in from Los Angeles. And what happened was while I was running lines one day running through the house and I always said, my child's gonna think I'm crazy because I'm running lines and I'm not talking to her, but I'm just, so she said to me, mommy, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing my monologue. She said, I want a monologue. I said, okay. So I said, whatever the line was, that was her monologue and she was good. So of course she's attending rehearsals. Two weeks later, I'm running through the house and I'm running my lines. And I said, and she says the next line. And I say, so, 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 and she says the person's line. And I'm, oh my God, this child has memorized the play. She's 18 months old. So now when my, my mother and my brother are sitting at the performance, they said, my mother looked at my brother and said, her mouth is moving, what is she doing? She was doing the lines to the play. <laughs> 20 years later, when she's playing the lead in the very same play at Horizon, Shea Youngblood said to her, you memorized my play when you were 18 months old. This is the kind of stuff that Amber does. And, and, and sometimes at the horizon, you know, it's very intimate. And back in the day, I guess you could do crazy stuff like this. She would sit and watch the play, come back stage, go to potty, have a cookie and come back out and sit down. And when you see people, they, when you think about it, people are coming into the theater and there's a baby. And it's, uh, we, we paid for tickets and we're gonna sit next to her. And they said, she would sit there and watch the whole play. And then at the end, she would say, that's my mommy. Oh. And then she come back stage. So Amber literally grew up in the theater, understanding the theater. And when I'd go like to Chicago, I'd let her travel with me. And they would, the stage management would let her come backstage <clears throat> and let the, her work backstage doing what they do. So when she's in college and she's at the arena stage doing stick fly, the wardrobe person says to me, oh, your daughter's so nice. And she's this bad. And I'm like, well, what else would she be? Because see, people are used to actors being crazy. And I don't know why you're crazy. This is a team. So how is it that you would treat anybody or you would look down on anybody or you would be disrespectful to anybody in the theater? I just, for the love of me, and I don't care who you are, what your name is, I don't understand how you do that. So I was like, what else would she do? You're not out here by yourself. <laughs> and I'm trusting and believing me, we have lighting and sound and some other things that have to happen. So you could act crazy if you want. You'd be sitting up in the dark and then nobody can hear you. How about that? So how about be a team player? It's not about you. I just, I, and see, and I guess I have to go back to when you say I started young. I was singing when I was three. I was in my first uh, cantata or ballet uh, dance recital or something when I was six. Did stuff at church. And when I was eight years old, I was doing a play called Hans Christian Andersen. And I went to, to public schools in, in New York and we did shows. And this guy named Jose was supposed to play Hans Christian Andersen and he got sick. So Margot was Hans Christian Andersen. And every year after that, and every year and two or three, four times a year, I was in a play. That's what I did. It was just who I was. It wasn't, I woke up one morning and decided that I wanted to be an actor. I didn't make a choice. I think acting chose me. And I grew up doing musical theater. And when it was time to go to college, I decided I didn't just want to do musicals. I wanted to be taken seriously as an actor. At the age of three, Amber was playing, well, she wanted to be Rosa Parks in the play at Spelman. And she told me, if I can't be Rosa Parks in the play, I'm not gonna be in the play. I was like, oh my God, where did she come from? And I'm like, oh, and who is she listening to? I said, well, now, if that's something you would like to do, maybe you should talk to the teacher. And, you know, and so that morning, she was trying to drag me into the class. Oh, no, I don't want to be Rosa Parks. You want to be Rosa Parks. So she goes up and she taps the teacher on her leg. And later on, the teacher and I said, the teacher said, you, you know, Miss Mora, I had already selected Amber to be Rosa Parks. <laughs> but I, I just thought it was so interesting because at three years old and four years old, they had whatever that crazy nonsense is that actors do. <laughs> they had decided what role they were going to play and who they thought they were. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Which was real hard. And the thing about that was I didn't want her to think that that's the way it goes. 
And so at the age of nine, she declared she'd be an actress. And so, and I wanted her to be rich and famous. I didn't want her to be an actor, but she was very bright. And um, so therefore I decided that's how she got to you. <laughs> we didn't the street theater and the rest is history because if this is what you're going to do and she was a double magnet for math and acting at uh, north springs high you had to be and if you said this is what you were going to do well, then you're going to put in the work and you were going to do it and hopefully you all didn't have not an ounce or a lick of tr trouble out of her no we did not we did not go, my mama don't play the radio okay <laughs> 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 and so um I told her, you know, the importance of that. She'd gotten to do a film once when she was young and she came out of the door and she was grinning from ear to ear. And all I know is when they say cut, I ran across the people's front yard and I explained to her that this is, we're not, we're not in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> we're a part of the story. We're, we're telling a story here. And she got it. And that's the way we work. She may ask me a question about something but it's never, you should do this. I've never been a stage mother. I don't have that kind of patience. I don't have that kind of life. I'm too busy trying to work. Okay. <laughs> so say something. She'll call, I got this script. I said, and you don't want to do it. No, I said, and you don't do it. No is a real a whole sentence with a period. Next major. <laughs> but, and again, actors, if it's a project that you don't think that you want to do, you have to do that up in the front. You have to do that with the agent. You have to do that way ahead. You cannot get in the middle of somebody's project and decide you're not doing it. Now you're not gonna work for real, nowhere. So no up going in that this is a project that you wanna do, that this work in progress is in, in this on the job training is something that you wanna do. And, um, and every project is a learning process. You're working with actors. I mean, I, I did a, a piece, another Rob Ryan a piece I did called Shock and Awe dealing with uh, the weapons of mass destruction that were not. And Tommy Lee Jones, okay. an actor that I admired. And I, all I could do was sit there and look at him. Because, and then we talked later, but when you see the caliber, the talent that you get to work with, and when they bring you in, they assume that you are there. If they wanted somebody else other than you, they would have hired them. And so when you come in, you're there. And you never, ever want to make them think that they have made a mistake hiring you. Mm -hmm. so that's why you do your homework. You get in your trailer. You work through, work through. And uh, a lot of times, I play judges a lot. And uh, when I was doing Drop Dead Diva, it would be 14 hours before that camera turned on you. Because they have to get all those other shots. They're blocking shots and doing things and stacking shots to get through that day. So you, when they turn on you at the 14th hour, you're ready to go. So when Margot gets there and it's time for her to do all of her close-ups, all of her words, you want Margot to be there at the 14th hour doing what it is that she has to do. So then they can say, this is the martini shot. Yes, years ago, they'd be saying, checking the gate and you could leave the building. And they mm -hmm. like the fact that I could do it in one take and be out. So it's just, it's a concentrated effort. We're not there to socialize. We're not there to take pictures. We're not there <laughs> to, uh, no. When you're working, you're on the set. When I'm not working, I'm in my trailer. It, and you have to understand that you have actors who are different and they may not want to talk to you. And they may not want to take pictures with you. And so you have to, you know, if you've been on a set with them a long time, you've done, you know, it's two weeks, three weeks, then you're kind of feeling everybody out. You get to know how everybody works differently. And I won't even say that they're funny or strange. Everybody works differently. Everybody comes from different schools of thought. And if you have straight up method actors who don't, you don't exist in that world that they're living in, in their head. You know what I mean? So you just have to feel things out. And, 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 and take care of you and, and do your job. But I talk to background and I talk to extras because I, I don't understand that. I don't understand why I can't talk to my people. But right. we'll talk to them. Hey, how y'all doing? You learn sometimes some of them don't, they, they have boundaries and you have to set them because then it becomes too casual. And my mother always taught me, even before I guess I even thought about doing film, you don't become too common with people. So, um, 
you say you set your boundaries. You know, it's okay to say hello to me. And and, well, my... and like you said, it's all a family, or it should be. Thank it's you. all it takes honey, all of them to get it done. Thank you. They in your background making things work. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, you sitting out there by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> So what are you working on next? I can't tell you. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, go on it. I just signed the non-disclosure. And it was funny because the non-disclosure came in after, you know, we had auditioned. Some of them come in first. And, you know, there's a magical comic book industry that's here. You don't discuss anything about anything. And before you even audition, you're signing non-disclosures. So I've been blessed to say that since COVID um, has, you know, it's opening up now from over from COVID, um, I've had a lot of auditions and they're coming to fruition. I just can't say what they are. Okay. Well, congratulations on all of them coming to fruition. <laughs> Until it's in the can. Hallelujah. Deborah Duke and I, this is a famous story. Deborah Duke and I, I had done a piece and she had done a piece and we're both I did the Day of the Jackal, and she did this uh, movie. I want to say it had something to do with Alabama. What is the woman's name? I love it. Um, but anyway, we end up in the theater. She ends up in another theater. I'm in another one, watching two different movies, and it was the first time we've been cut from a show. So I tell people, do you see it? <laughs> you might want to wait because if you tell people you're going to do it, that's a whole lot of conversation. And then everybody wants to know all about it. And then now when it comes out and they go to the movie and you're not in it, now that's a whole nother conversation. So I prefer to just do the work. And then when the work is done, I'll take the blessing. Why you didn't tell me? And a lot of times you can't keep up with a lot of stuff that you're doing. You know what I mean? But I just think it's best to wait until it's actually in the can and you are, you know you're gonna be on, on the screen. And it was just funny, the day that we did the Day of the Jackal, one of the principals decided he'd wanna come to work that day. <laughs> and we were in a house where we rehearsed something nine times. I was in a scene with Sidney Poitier and Richard Gere. And we're coming into this house, there's, I'm ATF and the fire department's there and we're coming to investigate the fact that this woman is dead. Helicopters are flying. Now, you know, this is a big money day. They got helicopters landing on the, on the, the property and all. And someone who shall remain nameless decided he didn't feel like coming to work that day. So I'm sitting up in the movie and I get, we get to that scene and the helicopters come in and then and then the lady's dead, and then I'm, and they're on to something else. And I'm like, oh my God, scene was cut because somebody decided not to come to work. They shot around it and they had to edit it together to make it make sense. So when you spend a whole day, this, this particular director was Australian and he was from the school of you could take all day back in the day when you could take all day to do the movies, but you can't do that now. We rehearsed the scene nine times from top to bottom. And then we shot it, but then it didn't make, made the cutting room floor is what it, wow. it made. Why do you think they take less time now? I wanted to say somebody that you and I worked with back in the day. Uh-huh. I think okay. he's changed That's... a lot. I think he's changed a lot of things and showed folks that it can work. Uh -huh. And uh, you and I did that that uh, show together and we saw how that worked. Right. And um, the industry is, and now with COVID, yeah, they're finding out how to make things work and they're probably gonna change a lot of things and they're probably gonna add Zoom filming to, to, to uh, mm. a series as well as um, features. I'm thinking a lot of things have changed now. Because it's always about, when I talked about the unit production manager earlier, mm -hmm. it's about that money. It's about the money that's being spent per episode. And when I did Sheena, it was a million dollars an episode. And I'm quite sure there are movies like the comic book series and others that spent a whole lot more money 
per episode. And you're on a budget. You just can't just go through and spend and, you know, and then the idea is to make that money back and let the producers make, you know, profit and let the actors who've taken points make a profit. Not to spend all the money and it's a bomb and all those other things. So I'm thinking um, that you don't have the luxury now. You know, we see in movies done in five days and 19 days and 45 days. You don't have the luxury of three months anymore. Back then when I, when I did the Gump movie it was 93 and I'd been, I'd been working, I was there three months and two weeks I was off. They called my husband in Atlanta looking for me. <laughs> oh, and he was like, she's in South Carolina on the movie set. You know, I said, why y'all call my husband to make a man think I'm running around somewhere and not doing my job? <laughs> oh Lordy, they had so much money and so much time doing the movie that I was on hold. And I guess they thought, well, most people on hold would have gone back home. I didn't go back home. I sat there and I exercised and I walked around the town and I went to the restaurant and said, I did what you do. And the discipline of, I need to be here. You And that's another thing. We don't know when they're going to call us. It's true. We don't know if it's a, a, an exterior shot and now it decides to rain. And they did not know it was an unexpected rain. Now they're going interior and now they need you. So you need to be where you're supposed to be. And I was in a hotel in Beaufort, South Carolina. <laughs> so wow. you know, we don't have the luxury. I mean, some major, you know, and now that actors are doing their own movies and streaming and doing all that they're doing, they're finding ways to bring in um, the work. In, in shorter amounts of time than that. So than Atlanta that. has become a, a, a mecca for film. How yes. do you think that's going to affect our theater? That's a good one because see COVID affected theater to the point of theater was now becoming film. We had to do things on location. We're just gonna have to do great theater because people have too many options now. All this streaming and you know, it was different when you had the network and you went to the movies to see your favorite movie. Your movie did not come on television first. So I think producers are hard pressed now to just do exciting things. You have people who love theater. They want the, the live feel, the touch, the, the artists who want the immediate gratification of an audience. And they're just going to have to do some good shows. And I'm praying that shows that are written now Plays that are written now are gonna be very timely, very relevant, and speaking to diverse culture. And that's what I'm thinking it's going to have to happen. Even now when you watch television, um, because a lot of commercials were done from home during COVID and that works. And people like seeing people that look like them and act like them. And um, there's a, I saw something today where there's a brother and sister or somebody and they're, they're like in a commercial and I want to say it was Zoomed and they're just laughing. Some got them tickled and they are just laughing like people do. Not so that they're so staged and it has to be, the, no, it's more slice of life, more naturalistic delivery and more real. There's, it's a lot of realism now. And I'm thinking the theater is going to have to do the same. And I'm thinking they're, they're, they're going to kind of segue. They'll each take a little from the other. And I'm thinking that's what's going to have to happen to theater. And it's going to be representative of the community. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to have to be. Because you have to get the folk in the seats. And Broadway's having a harder time than regional theater. Because you have to get a person on a plane. You got to get them in a hotel. Then you got to get them to buy a ticket. I've, I've paid $159 to see my own child before. Okay. And that was considered a, a, like a group kind of situation. They have a special name for these tickets for family members when they come in. Yeah, $159. I've had to pay to see her. And I'm quite sure I think ticket prices are going to go up. And uh, they're going to figure out how to get people in those small houses 
in New York mm -hmm. and uh, keep everybody safe. Because when she did this thing about these pop up on Broadway, everyone had to show that, you know, that they had been vaccinated and to, to, to keep everybody from being sick. Mm -hmm. What haven't we talked about that you feel like you really need to talk about? I think we kind of covered it. Um, people who want to do this industry, people who want to be in the film, theater, all of it. I, that's the only thing I like to cover. Study your craft, master your craft. Know how to be in the environment. Because even though Atlanta has become the town, it's becoming the town. We're getting people from all walks of life who really don't understand what it is that you do on a set. And I think there are enough classes in town that you can take a class or become an extra, become background. I often tell people, I cannot wake up in the morning and decide I'm going to be an orthodontist. I can't do it. <laughs> or if I do, I hope you won't let me work in your mouth. Okay? So if you wake up tomorrow morning, <laughs> I, I would hope that you would have study. You go online and study. You can go to the library, learn about your craft, take acting classes, call Brenda Porter up. <laughs> <laughs> and just understand the nature of the business. Understand what it is to tell stories. Why you're telling them. Just master the craft, if that's what you're going to do. This is what you want to do. Thank you, Margo, so much Thank for taking the time you. to sit down with me on the couch. And if you're out there uh, with us today, thank you so much for joining us. Remember to like us, comment below, and uh, subscribe. Come back next week when we will have another conversation. Meanwhile, keep the conversation going. Let's have a heart to heart. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a heart to heart. Let's have a consultation. Let's have a heart to heart. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a heart to heart. Let's have a conversation. On the couch.